Welcome to chapter 20, our last chapter. And today, or in this lecture, we are going to focus on coastal processes. So in the background, you can imagine this is a terrible image. This is from the 2011 earthquake in tsunami that hit coastal Japan. We've already talked about earthquakes, but we're gonna get into uh, the mechanics of tsunamis toward the end of this chapter and some devastating uh, impacts of tsunamis. Now you might think of tsunamis as a giant wall of water that comes toward you like you see in this picture, but actually most tsunamis are not that tall. It's the forward push of that water that really has the devastating impact. So some big picture questions for chapter 20 will include, what really changes sea level from place to place? What are tides? And what exactly are the differences between spring and neap tides? What are various coastal formations? What are some of the ways that we have eroding coastal uh, features and landscapes? And how and why do tsunamis form? Common terms for chapter 20, we're going to get into different kinds of tides. We're going to get into what causes waves, what wave refraction is, some coastal features such as a spit, tumbolo, baymouth bar, and a barrier island. Even though this isn't in the book, we're going to talk about rip currents and then end it with tsunamis. So I'd like to start a lot of my lectures with a picture. And my question to you right now is that we're, we're looking at this cliff, but why exactly are there areas that are green toward the bottom of this cliff? And the answer really comes down to tides. In this area right here, there is a very high tide that keeps a mark up there, and we're seeing a very low tide so that there's a very large tidal range. And this is in the Bay of Fundy in northeastern Canada. So when it's high tide, there's enough time for algae to grow onto this cliff. Pretty cool, huh? So there's other interesting pictures of tides and what they can do. Sometimes when we have a low tide, certain boats can be stranded because there's just no water. And then high tide, you have the water where you see in this picture no water. You can actually have water um, filling in the, the bay. It just depends on the local topography and the geography of bays and inlets um, that determines how high and low your tides are. But you might be wondering, well, what are some other reasons why we have tides? And what is the actual uh, physical a mechanism for tides. It has to do with the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon. So probably most of you have heard that the moon will cause tides, but the, the sun does uh, has about 50% power as the moon does. Keep in mind, the sun is 93 million miles away, but it's so big compared to the moon. The moon is much closer but it's small. Now, when we have times where we have really high tides and then really low tides, we call those spring tides. And that occurs when the earth, moon, and sun are in alignment, make a straight line. And that occurs when we have a new moon or a full moon. So, you might be wondering how many tides do we have? How many tides do we have during the day? We have two high tides and two low tides every single day. But during the new moon and full moon, those high tides are really high and the low tides are really low. So we have a very large tidal range. However, when it's first quarter or third quarter moon, then the sun and the moon act not together, but sort of in opposition. So our high tides aren't really high 
and our low tides aren't that low. So we have a minimal tidal range, and we call those neap tides. Now tides can actually be significant agents of erosion. And that's what this slide is really all about. It's, it's showing you that a certain area in um, northeastern Canada, actually just north of Maine, the Bay of Fundy, where this section right here has been eroded away relatively recently, because you can see trees growing on top of this, what we call sea stack. So the, the tides in this area, because, the, because they range uh, very dramatically and they can erode a lot of the, the erodible rocks along the coast, we get these sort of um, isolated, um, looks like you know, stacks of rocks, but we call those sea stacks. So tides don't just you know, create great um, surfing waves or, or strand boats in a harbor, but they can actually uh, be agents of erosion. So here's just some more um, examples where we have a difference between high and low tide. So take a look at the two pictures on the top where you have a dramatic difference. And when we don't have, or when we have a low tide, these boats are basically stranded. Another image is down here on the lower left. In some places, the tides can be uh, powerful enough to produce tidal power. So you, you have right here an electricity generating station due to tides. Tides, as we just noticed, will move the water up or down based on the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon. And, and it depends on where the moon is when it's, when it's um, rotating around, or I should say revolving around the Earth. So that might make you wonder, well, what is the sea level like in different places? You might think that because water, you know, you look out at the water, it's very flat. But in reality, there is changing topography of the surface of the ocean. Tides, storms, and other wind patterns can actually temporarily, and in certain locations, alter mean sea level. I like to show this picture because this picture is showing a significant area here with very high, or I should say much above average when it comes to uh, the sea level. Any idea why? Remembering that this is in October. Well, it comes down to there was a typhoon just off the coast, just um, south of Japan and off the coast of China. And if you remember back in chapter seven with hurricanes and typhoons, the low pressure in those systems are so low that the water can actually rise. And that's what's happening in this picture. Another example is El Nino. So this is showing an El Nino where we have warm, warmer than average waters in the Eastern and Central Pacific. Warmer water will expand just a little bit and create higher than normal um, sea levels. So when it comes to the sea levels and storms, we often get waves. And much of this chapter is going to focus on waves. What causes waves and what do waves do to the landscape? Here's another cool image of waves. This is you know, more like a time-lapse view of waves. And as you can see, even right here, eventually this part will erode away. Very similar to waterfalls eroding away the bedrock underneath. So coastal processes affect a tiny portion of the Earth's, Earth's landscape, but that landscape is very, very important for just for human civilization, for navigation and for our, our livelihood that we know of today. It also brings together all four spheres of the Earth that we've been talking about in this class. It brings together the hydrosphere in the way of the ocean, the lithosphere, the land, 
the atmosphere, the air around it, and there's always life that's, that's either found or thriving. In addition, this is where we get to talk about waves and how waves can actually deposit or erode part of the landscape. Because of that, beaches that mark this transition between land and water are highly variable. And so what you're seeing here is Port Edward in part of South Africa. Another very cool, very interesting example of the power of water. These are sea stacks, but these sea stacks are much older than the ones that we saw the, in, in Eastern Canada. But, be, but in the same way, the power of water has eroded away part of this coast to leave these isolated stacks. Now, let's talk about waves for a second. When waves are, are um, traveling through deep water, and by the way, waves almost always are caused by wind and the frictional force of the wind on the water. But when we have wave action in an open ocean where it's deep, we see elliptical motion. So we don't see a lot of forward movement of the water. We see more water oscillating up and down. But as these waves travel close to the coast, they start to feel the bottom of, of the ocean. And then they start to get dragged. And then the motion of water, poly, uh, water particles become elliptical. And that will raise the wave itself to the point where it breaks. And where it breaks is often where you have the characteristic um, waves that you like to see when you go to the beach. And then with that will be some backwash. And that backwash has a lot to do with rip currents we'll talk in a minute about. Now, when we have these waves traveling toward the coast, because the coast is irregular and at the bottom of the ocean is also irregular with different um, topographies, we see a change in direction of the waves. So the waves are bent due to some parts of those waves slowing down and other parts speeding up. So what we find because of that is that the waves tend to focus toward headlands and then defocus when we get into a bay, a bay like right here. So eventually over time, the coast will straighten because with erosion, we have the headlands going away, and then with deposition, we have the bays filling up. So there's so coastlines are quite dynamic, especially over long periods of time. In addition to waves, if we have a strong wind that we see a dominant wind parallel to the beach, and because waves travel at an angle, not necessarily straight, we can get something called a longshore current. This longshore current is parallel to the beach. And if you've ever gone to the beach in the Santa Monica Bay, you may have noticed that you're, you, you might go out into the water for a little bit. And then over time, you look back at the beach and you're no longer, you're no longer you know, dead on where you started because the longshore current has moved you. Um, I think the longshore current in the, in the Santa Monica Bay moves southward, yes. And so that's interesting in, in terms of you know, swimming in the ocean, but also what it can do is it can actually change the, the layout of the beach. It could create uh, sand dunes actually, in some cases uh, for deposition or little uh, bays, uh, scoured out bays when we have erosion. So along with the longshore current, if we have water dumping into the ocean, we can get a few kinds of features. The first one is a spit. So a spit is essentially land that extends out into a bay, but it doesn't make it all the way to the other side of the bay. So there's a little bit of water that's still flowing outward. If that 
extension of the land goes from one end of the bay to the other, it's called a bay mouth bar. And the bay is actually no longer a bay, it's a lagoon. If we have a perpendicular extension of land, perpendicular to the beach, and it can extend out to, let's say, um, uh, a sea stack, we call that a tombolo. So lots of interesting features are, are, are created along the coast because of wave refraction and because of the longshore current. And you see a beautiful example of a tombolo off the coast of Australia. Also, we might see islands that are actually built up from the sandbar. And these islands are formed parallel to the coast. They only, they're very shallow. They only rise to about a few meters above sea level. And, you know, fortunately, they're beautiful places uh, to live. Unfortunately, if you live on one of these islands and you have um, uh, a high risk for hurricanes, they can be a devastating place to be. The Galveston hurricane of 1900, which Galveston, Texas, is on a, a barrier island, killed thousands of people because, well, think about it. In 1900, we really didn't have a way to warn people of hurricanes. We didn't even have the knowledge. And we also didn't have a good way to evacuate. When we get into areas like California, where we have a lot of tectonic activity, we can see erosion on sort of a, a stepwise manner. So let's take a look at this image here. We have a sea cliff, and above that is a flat plain. That used to be where the beach was at one time. And then we go up higher, and we see another cliff. We can call that a wave cut platform. And then we see another one. So these series of steps they look like, they used to be sea cliffs. And those, these flat areas used to be the beach where the sea was. And there are two primary reasons why we have this. First, sea levels have changed throughout time, long periods of time. Second, these areas are in tectonically active areas where the land has actually been, you know, been pushed upward or sometimes downward due to earthquakes. And also some interesting uh, features we might find because of erosion are sea caves. Down here is a really cool looking sea stack. And sometimes you will see notches in the side of a cliff if we have enough wave action. One thing I got to note is that you know building on these these beautiful landscapes can be inviting but it can also be dangerous they can collapse because we have something called beach erosion so beach erosion essentially sounds what it is what it sounds like we've talked already about erosion but if you build on these beaches you're prone to erosion especially if you have very loose sand so, you, so after a hurricane, these houses down here, are, I don't think are very um, habitable. You can see where the, the sand used to be, way up here at the bottom of this fire hydrant. Quite incredible how much sand has been eroded away just by one storm. So this tends to happen more with flat sandy beaches, but when you live on a cliff, you're still not out of the woods. If we have a strong storm with a lot of waves, it can weaken the sides of these cliffs, which thereby could weaken a house. This happened quite dramatically in the 1997-98 El Nino that affected much of California. Now, rip currents, rip currents are interesting because they are a return flow, a very quick moving return flow of water every time we have of uh, you know waves breaking onto the beach but if there is a break in the sandbar then this this sort of river of water that's that's moving outward toward the sea can go really fast unfortunately it, it looks like when you have a rip current they often look 
not as choppy as you see here. They often look very inviting to swim in because there there's not a lot of a lot of uh, waves breaking. But that's you know that's an unfortunate um, characteristic because people want to go in that and then they get stuck into these rip currents. Now there are ways to get out of the rip current, and the best way, and it's not easy advice, is to not panic, but to swim, you know, perpendicular to the whim, uh, to the rip current or parallel to the beach. I have posted on Canvas a good video that talks a lot more about rip currents. So that brings us to tsunamis. So we've already talked about earthquakes and volcanoes in, in previous chapters. I save this for tsunamis because this is a, a, a an oceanic um, a phenomenon, but it is tied to earthquakes, and in some cases volcanoes, and in even in other cases landslides. But there's a lot of um, misinformation about tsunamis. So first of all, a tsunami is not a tidal wave. It occurs by some kind of disruption of the ocean floor. Most often, it occurs when we have a normal fault or a reverse fault creating an earthquake. And we get an, a sudden upward displacement of water, which then will spill out onto the, to the surface of the ocean and create very quick waves. And we're talking about waves that, waves traveling nearly 500 miles per hour in the open ocean. However, in the open ocean, if you had to experience a tsunami, that's where you want to be because they're barely noticeable in the open ocean. But when they get close to the coast, they slow down, the wave height gets much higher, and they start to spill water onto, onto land, which is where most of the danger is. So by definition, Tsunami means harbor wave, but in the media or in the general public, they often call them tidal waves, but tsunamis have nothing to do with the tides. Here's an interesting example. This is, this is one that happened in 2004. This was the Indian Ocean tsunami on December 26, 2004. It devastated parts of Indonesia, India, Malaysia, what I'm showing you right here is that the height of these tsunami waves in the open ocean are only a few centimeters above sea level. But you can't see it on this map. Once they get to land, the height does increase to pretty dramatic heights. It, it can be. But again, the most dangerous part of a tsunami is the long wave. So there's a lot of distance from one tsunami wave to another. And when tsunamis hit land, you can get multiple waves, but the, because the wavelength is so long, the forward push of the water seems to continue for a very long time. It can go very far inland. It basically goes as inland as it can until it hits higher ground. So the one I was just talking about, the 2004 tsunami, was, a, was caused by a magnitude 9.1 on the ocean floor. So that's the thing. These have to be, tsunamis are caused by ocean floor earthquakes. And a piece of the ocean floor had, had risen to create the tsunami. And because much of Indonesia is flat, it washed away entire villages and almost a quarter of a million people died. The 2011 uh, tsunami was caused by a magnitude 9.0 earthquake uh, off the coast of Japan, so it was on the bottom of the ocean floor. Nearly 16,000 people died and 130,000 people were left homeless. In a, in a nation prepared for these tsunamis, it still did, did this kind of damage. So when we have a disruption on the ocean floor, what happens is we have a sudden uplift of water. Now that sudden uplift of water, kind of like a spring, doesn't just go right back to, to where the water should be. It oscillates. So this oscillation 
is because it's trying to regain equilibrium. Now the tsunami speed is very high in the open ocean, but as the, as the um, wave gets close to the coast, it slows down, thankfully, but its height increases. This is an image, a terrifying image, basically of, this is tsunami water, but it doesn't look like water anymore. It looks like a glacier of debris. You see water with boats, houses, and, and stuff on fire. And if this were in a video, you can actually Google, you know, the Japan tsunami of 2011. You'll see some horrific videos of, you know, of these kinds of, um, of images and they're moving very fast. Now, one interesting part about that is that even though that the tsunami loses energy, uh, it has a strong shoreward or um, landward push. And, um, and there's also quite a bit of turbulence involved because of the friction when it hits the land. So even though they slow down, even though they, they aren't 500 miles per hour at the coast, and even though they're not, you know, like I showed in the beginning of this lecture, they're not as tall as those waves you see. They're tall enough, they're powerful enough to do tremendous amount of damage.